Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching this weekly Ag Weather Update brought to you by Ag South Farm Credit. I want to start you off with looking at the last seven days of total accumulated precipitation. The big story for much of the southeast was this low that started here, taking almost tropical characteristics with it all the way down into parts of Florida before making this turn up the east coast. Now, what prevented it from really coming into Ag South territory, although it did bring in some scattered showers and some thunderstorms in through here, was there was another front that slid through here, punching it back out to open ocean. So in other words, this one came through and knocked this guy out. Now, to be honest with you, if, if you're listening to me right now, kind of going, Eric, you kind of keep talking a lot about rainfall that's supposed to be here by now that's not really gotten into our area. And I, I really understand that. This has been something where I've had a bit of difficulty trying to pin down exactly when these wet, this wet episode was supposed to start. I thought it'd be here well before the middle of this month. Yet if we look at the month-to-date rainfall statistics, we can see that most of, of Ag South Territory, especially up into North Carolina here, we're talking about near record dry. I mean, it's the opposite of what we had forecast. We had thought much better moisture would be getting into this area by this time. Now, that's the same that holds true for much of New England. It's the same for much of the Midwest. Uh, in fact, there are places throughout the Midwest that are just as dry. Uh, many climate reporting districts in through here post-harvest are right now having some of the driest go of it we've seen into this point into the middle of the month. And the drought monitor has reflected it. It continues to kind of keep the drought lingering here, and it's expanded it out of Louisiana and Mississippi farther over toward the Appalachian Mountains. And there are a, an increasing area that has kind of shown up here in the drought monitor uh, map into parts of Axe South Territory. You know, one thing I didn't bring up, which I'd like to show you, would just be the 14-day, uh, uh, the last 14 days. Just take note here of, of how dry it has been these last two weeks and places that are in this deepest red or where we've not measured any precipitation. So I think about this, and it makes me think about some of the bigger problems we've been having with this, like, for example, the Mississippi River, which right now, you know, uh, here late in the evening on Sunday night is nine feet below low stage. It had made a brief recovery, uh, but it has since dropped back off given those incredibly dry conditions. So there's a lot of people where I live and a lot where you are all, uh, where all of you are that are looking at this system, kind of got a bit of a, you know, a glimmer of hope in it for bringing in some moisture. So this was through Sunday evening, and we're looking here at um, just radar imagery of the low that was off the coast of California. It came through the southwest over the weekend and is now merged into the plains. Supporting this is going to be a pretty you know energetic piece of the subtropical jet that's going to come in here. And that's why the next couple of weeks looks quite wet for parts of the southeast and Axe South Territory. One quick note is this storm system did show up. It produced um, some severe weather. In fact, it made um, a tornado report in central Arizona over the weekend. Quite impressive. Maybe some of you saw that on social media or in the news. So this is our next hope for a system that's going to come through. And there are a couple of other systems that are going to follow this. But you're about to see here in the next few moments some pretty major model discrepancy overall in what we're talking about here. The story all begins in the upper levels of the atmosphere, so I got to keep taking you there. And we're going to start this off by looking down on the North Pole. We're going to be keeping an eye on what the jet streams up through, uh, up to, excuse me, going on through this week. Now, one thing that I see is kind of a constant as I play this forward through Friday, is that the speed stays high down here. You don't ever want to get out of the flow. Okay, if we get out of the flow, we're talking about drought problems. For example, you take a look here in a few moments at what I'm about to show you for the Northwest. But as we play through this week, yeah, we got some colder air coming through. We have a system that's pretty potent coming through. But even in the next weekend, I mean, look at the speed of the jet stream coming across parts of the Mid-South, exiting through North Carolina and Virginia. We're talking about wind speeds here that are ranging, you know, 150 knot, maybe higher. I mean, this is a really screaming piece of the jet stream. And as a result, we expect to see a lot of activity underneath this. So if I play out to the end of the month and take it beyond that, the jet retracts across the Pacific Ocean, tries to punch its way back out later as we get into December, but this is the piece I'm watching. And that piece that you see there, that subtropical component, is really what's driving the precipitation pattern over the next two weeks for much of Ag South Territory. Take a look. They've got dry conditions here where there is no flow, drier conditions in through here where there is no flow. But the subtropical jet comes through, and that's why, again, we see the Ag South Territory showing up on the wetter side of average in this forecast. If we just kind of take a quick look down there into the southeast, you can see that over the next two weeks, we are expecting rainfall amounts to be almost an inch to an inch and a half more than what we normally get for a two-week time frame. So you, you listen to me say that, and you go, well, Eric, you've kind of been talking about this since the end of October, 
and it hasn't yet manifest itself. When is this going to be coming through? Well, I think we do have finally better evidence of better flow, even though there is a bit of model discrepancy, which I'm going to show you in a few moments. So to get started here on Monday, we've got a deep low cranking up right in this area. And there's going to be the initiation of some severe weather into the lower Mississippi River Valley. Now, if that brings rain to the lower Mississippi River Valley, they'll take it. But take a look at what we're looking at right here. These three maps show you here on Monday and Tuesday. So I record these on Sunday night, so that's why you got the Sunday night map there. But on Monday, I mean, there's an enhanced risk of severe weather that goes right into parts of Louisiana and Mississippi. And just so you know, this is the driest spot in the country compared to average. So some fast-moving storms, the risk of some of them being tornadic, that is in the cards for this area. As we then go into Tuesday, you can see some of that severe thunderstorm risk uh, starts to move its way into Ag South territory. But at this point, we're not expecting the system to kind of hold itself together to make a widespread severe weather threat Tuesday into Wednesday. But our high res models have picked up on this. So let's pick it up here on Monday morning. You're going to see, watch this, by Monday afternoon and evening, look at that surge of moisture coming in through here. And several of the models are taking the wind shear in this area and spinning up supercells, giving us the risk of strong and severe storms. Most of access territory, maybe a couple of isolated showers, thunderstorms, isolated storms here, but very, very isolated. Not a whole lot of wet weather coming in on Monday. It all gets here by Tuesday. So this is 6 a.m. Tuesday playing through the day on Tuesday, and that's when that frontal boundary really starts to cut across there. Sorry about that little skip there. But you see that frontal boundary cutting across by the time we get into Tuesday evening, and that's where we're going to see our increased chances of, uh, of strong to severe storms. Now, what I'm about to do next, though, is this is our high-res NAM model. I want to compare our two flagship models, the one the United States runs called the GFS to the one that's run out in Europe called the ECMWF. And that's what this map is going to show you. So what's important about this map is this shade of color, and I've shown this to you in the past, but just a quick reminder, this shade of color represents where the European model is the wetter model. And this represents where the GFS is the wetter model. Okay, so if you see all of this blue green in through here, these shades, that means that the solution provided by the European model is much wetter than the GFS. Where's the GFS wetter? Maybe in Florida, maybe in parts of North Carolina. That's it. Most of the next seven to 10 days, the European model is putting down a whole lot more precipitation than the GFS. That's what this is showing. Now to compare those two models, I've got on the left, the GFS, and on the right, I have the European model. I'm gonna take you back. I was getting a little ahead of myself here, but this is what I've got. Monday into Tuesday. That's when we expect that system look really well-timed in both models. By Tuesday night coming through here, giving us the chance for those strong to severe storms. It is in both models. Again, I know I told you that the threat is not as high as it is on Monday night for the lower Mississippi River Valley, but we could have some strong storms on Tuesday night. Now that front clears by Wednesday. See it? So this is midday Wednesday, Wednesday evening getting into Thursday morning. It's out. We'll take a look at the precip totals in a second. What we're watching for after that is where the models start to see things differently. You see, there's a wave coming into the four corner states and up into Wyoming, bringing in some snow. But the GFS, which is over on the left, does not bring out another low here like the European model does. So see how there's much farther to the north, that kind of the shield of precipitation in the European model. So it brings in that rainfall that's not even really being resolved by the GFS. This is late this week. This is Friday and Saturday after you know Thanksgiving. So it looks like we could have a, a late week push of some wet weather. Now, what's supportive of this? Well, you know there's cold air that's trying to come in, and it's trying to make the turn based off of the subtropical jet. So I'm, I, I buy into the European solution, but I want to let you know I have some uncertainties and some doubts because of what the GFS is saying. So this would be uh, Friday midday getting into Saturday and Sunday. Now watch what happens as we get into early next week. The European model does it again. You see, nowhere in the GFS do we see this heavy precipitation early next week, next Monday, Tuesday. So that got us just thinking here, like, what, what, what's going on with the European that it's so more aggressive with all this rainfall? And it's not in the U.S. model, the, 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 um, the, uh, the GFS. It all has to do with the position of that big subtropical jet. The European is keeping it right here and it's just not there in the GFS. So this will be a, a bit of a, mat, uh, uh, excuse me, a model battle <laughs> as we watch it going forward. And to show you the wetter of the two models, this is the GFS. Ah, forgive me. This is the European model. That's the one that's wetter. Ready? 
Here's the first big push. Here's the second big push. That's this weekend. And there's the third one early next week. Now you look at these 10 day totals and I see a lot of one to two inch rainfall events here, locally even heavier. But this is exactly what we need. We need to get this moisture into place. So let's do another way of comparing this. I'm gonna take you to the European Ensemble. So this is where we run the model 101 times. And we're gonna search out for uh, chances of getting more than an inch of rain in the next 10 days. So this is where the ensemble is putting that down. Now, what I wanna do for you is I'm gonna come over here and we're gonna choose the GFS Ensemble. And that's its forecast for better than an inch in the next 10 days. So it's not as though the GFS is overly dry in its ensemble. It's probability between 50 and 80% for most of Axhead territory, but higher up here and toward Virginia. But it is important just to note that the European model, oops, let's go back and switch back to the 12Z run. There we go. That it is trying to bring in quite a bit of moisture. So this could be the beginning of this wetter stretch that we expected in fall, albeit about 15 days later than what I had hoped. That's what I'm watching for. And certainly the jet stream out there in week two is still conducive to this. This is on the 29th. Look at this trough here, but look what's happening to the south side of it. There is good flow coming around the base of this trough, and that's what's going to keep this whole area. Look at the models. There's the CPC, there's the European, and there's the GFS. All of them are trying to keep the whole southern tier of the U.S. a bit wetter than average. Now, does it get drier toward the Appalachian Mountains? I think it does in all three models, but we'll keep an eye out on that pretty carefully. Now, I do need to show you that there is this sizable system. You saw it a moment ago that might go up the East Coast. It's late this week, and then another push into the weekend. Look at all that snow that is possibly getting up here in Vermont and Maine. But don't be surprised if enough cold air comes in to put a little bit of snow down in this section of the Appalachian Mountains. Temperature-wise, this is where we're expecting a frost over the next seven days. And while it did, did dig a bit deeper, sorry, that's a tongue twister, down here into the south, we did not see quite uh, the depth of the cold air getting into the southeast as we had a forecast a week ago. Let me show it to you. This is uh, Sunday's high, so let's get to Monday. There we go. And as we go from Monday into Tuesday, still a more mild day here across parts of the south and southeast. Even into Wednesday, most of Ag South territory hit near average. But on Thanksgiving, we have a cold push. But some of the earlier forecast model runs, ones I showed you a week ago, we saw these temperatures getting down here in the 40s for highs. So this is a significant warm-up in the forecast for Thanksgiving as compared to what I was worried about. It still sticks around Thursday into Friday and Saturday, okay? So we, it's not as though we break over warm after that, but um, you can see that the depth of this cold air is not nearly as deep as we thought. Looking at the five-day sliding window, watch the cold air come in. There it is and watch it kind of set up shop across parts of the plains. And then as we work our way into the end of this month and the start of the new one, the likelihood of starting off on the cooler side of average is a bit higher than otherwise. But still, okay, this isn't like the super deep penetrating cold that we can get, you know, in the middle of winter. Now, overall, we do see that the pattern is conducive to bring in some precipitation. But there's something that's kind of stirring the pot that I'm kind of excited about, which means that I think we're going to be getting just a bit more activity, more resistance to the pattern just getting stuck for a long time. And what I'm talking about here is the MJO. Now, we're still ahead of the time of year where the North Atlantic Oscillation or the Arctic Oscillation or anything that is associated with really, really cold winter conditions has yet to grab, uh, grab hold of the pattern. So I'm still watching the tropics. And the MJO is expected to sneak out into the Indian Ocean and move north of Australia. That's what phase four and five is. And just to see it doing this is something new. And here's the other part of it. I know you probably don't like looking at these diagrams, but man, I could stare at them all day because they tell me so much about what's going on. Here we are today through the next 15 days. And what I'm seeing here in this pattern is big westerly wind burst. That's, that is an El Nino signal if I ever saw one. And then where did it go? It just fades. So you see this El Nino, while it's, while it's there, isn't fully dominating the pattern. It's giving us help. And when I say it's giving us help, this is how you're seeing it. The month of December is expected to be wet. 
I know you're like, I've seen this before, Eric. I said, I know, but there's more of a subtropical component of the jet now than I've seen in the last couple of years. So there's some help early, you know, in this winter time frame. I mean, I know it's still fall, but there's, it, 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 you know, we're getting into December here. There's still decent chances of us keeping the above average precipitation and beating back that longer term drought stress. And it's not just the European model that sees it. Take a look. This is the newest outlook on the seasonal drought monitor as given to us by uh, the CPC. And you can now see it says, you know, drought remains but improves or drought removals likely. I mean, it's got this whole area with better chances of getting rid of it. In fact, take a look. This is the week three, week four outlook. Wow, sorry. Wetter than average. This is the new one month outlook. Wetter than average. And the new three month outlook, which is the most recent one to be released. I showed you the others last week. This is the new December, January, February outlook from the um, IRI multi-model probability forecast system. They've got you almost up to a 50 to 60% chance of staying in the above normal category. So we start to look at this and, and it's, um, you know, the, the, the probability of it being the most likely category is high. So there's still evidence that this El Nino is helping here, but it's not really giving us typical El Nino behavior a lot of other places. And one of those places is in South America. Now take a look at the next 10 days in South America. We finally have a front that's advancing into North Central Brazil. This is some of the first rain in this area. and I mean, big widespread rain in a long time. They had been exceptionally hot. In fact, I'm sure you all heard about this over the weekend, but I pulled up the news article. Apparently Taylor Swift had to cancel a show uh, because of the heat that was down there. But there's a front on its way to deliver rain and it's gonna be cooling things off in a big way. Now I mentioned that this El Nino is not quite your full blown El Nino. Uh, what I mean by that is where's all the rain in Argentina? That's typical of El Nino, wet to be in Argentina. Take a look at how stormy Europe is. I mean, that that strong pattern of strong jet stream flow here is more characteristic of the heat that's in the Atlantic than the heat that's in the Pacific. And then this is one very interesting signal. Take a look at Australia. Very wet on the East Coast. Now you're saying, what's that matter? Well, normally in this strong El Nino event, this is bone dry. So this El Nino has got an interesting flavor to it. it. It is an El Nino. It's there. Some parts of the atmosphere, like right where we are, is giving us what we typically expect. But it's not the full-blown El Nino that dominates everything. And I think that this particular El Nino event is going to peak within the next 60 days. And that'll take us to the beginning of the new year. And it'll start to fade after that. So we'll have to watch a lot of different things move around in this pattern. But as it stands, you now know my perspective on things here for the next couple of weeks and beyond. Let's kind of keep our fingers crossed that these longer range forecasts for December have got this right, because certainly we missed it for the front half of November. I mean, and I'll be honest, you take this one system that I started off with here, which kept crept along the coast, and you move it 150 miles farther to the north, and now we're talking about heavy, heavy rain. Uh, so that was it. We were that close with this previous system. But uh, I can't argue against the stats, and I can't argue against the drought monitor. That's what we're working ourselves against here. I'll stop here. I look forward to talking to you again next Monday. Until then, have a good one. Thanks.